Hey, thanks for joining us for the last session of our summer series. If you've been following along all summer, I really hope that you've been blessed from each of these messages that have been presented to us from God's Word. So for the last session, session eight of our summer series, we've got a dear friend and a brother in Christ who's going to be speaking to us. His name is Andrew Itson. Andrew is the preaching minister at the Robertsdale Church of Christ. He's been there a little over seven years. Uh, he and his wife, Lorianne, have three children, just a wonderful family, wonderful man of God. I can't wait for you to hear his message. He's a good friend and a dear brother in Christ, one who I really enjoy spending time with. So he's got a powerful message to us uh, that I think you'll really enjoy that talks about how we can find purpose in our work because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I really know you'll be blessed by his message. Uh, I want to pray for us and then we'll turn it over to Andrew. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to uh, grow in our knowledge and our love for you. And Father, I just pray that you would use this message uh, to strengthen us, to encourage us, and to draw us closer to you. Lord, thank you for Andrew, for his ability to communicate your word so powerfully. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Larry Walters had always dreamed of flying a balloon to a faraway place. So with help from a friend who taped these scenes, he rigged 42 weather balloons to a lawn chair and filled them with helium. Walters hoped to fly across the mountains to the Mojave Desert, staying in touch with a CB radio. Suddenly a cable broke and up he went with one emotion. Fulfillment. I was on my way. The first casualty, his glasses. They slipped overboard, leading to this radio transmission with his girlfriend. The balloon reached 16,000 feet, spotted by two astonished airline pilots. But the craft wasn't moving, so after nearly two hours, Walter shot out some balloons with a BB gun and came down fast over Long Beach, the only time he was frightened. I saw were roof tops and power lines. And I thought to myself, my, my God, this is it. You know, please God, you know, don't let me get fried. Today, Walter said he has no intention of going ballooning again. His first priority now is to sell the rights to his story. David Burrington, NBC News, Los Angeles. In 1982, Larry Walters attached 42 helium-filled weather balloons to a lawn chair. And his plan was to slowly ascend to about two to 3,000 feet in the air. But as you just saw in the video, he didn't slowly do anything. The cord snapped and he shot off like a rocket from the top of the roof of that house and ended up being elevated up to 16,000 feet in the air. In fact, as you heard, he was actually so high in the air that he actually made eye contact with two different airplane pilots. And I thought it was really interesting that he said that the one emotion he felt more than any other thing was fulfillment. Now, if I'm shooting like a rocket into the air attached to a lawn chair, the last thing I would probably say that I am feeling is fulfillment. I also think it's funny that as he floated up in the air, he lost his glasses, and his girlfriend was so concerned, she said, you need your glasses, and he knew this might be a possibility, so he actually had a backup pair. Now, if you're watching this video like I am, you're wondering the same exact thing. Why? Like, what makes you attach 42 helium-filled weather balloons to a lawn chair and want to float up in the air? And so a newspaper reporter actually had that same exact question for Larry, and so he sat down with Larry. He said, Larry, everyone's wanting to know this. Why? And this is what Larry said. Quote, I guess I just wanted to do something with my life. End quote. I think there's a little bit of Larry inside of every single one of us. Not that we're going to attach 42 helium-filled weather balloons to a lawn chair and try to float up into space, but I think there's something within all of us that wants to do something big with our life. Might we even say we want to do something bigger than even we're currently doing? Maybe for some of you, you're at a job and you look at the same cubicle every single day. You look at the same boss, the same co-workers. You look at those same four walls. Maybe if you're a mom and you're staying at home with your kids, you're cleaning up messes, and it's like rinse, repeat. 
Like one person said, it's a, a constant pattern of cleaning up messes and it's like trying to brush your teeth while eating an Oreo. I mean, that's your life and you think, all right, is this really what I want to do with my life? I want to be a part of something bigger. Is this God's will for me? And, and is this really what I thought I was going to do? And, and this is something that I really honestly want to do in the first place. And, and I would say that the one place that we seek to kind of answer that question, that sometimes the place that we ask that question the most is probably at work. In fact, it's been said that the average American spends 80,000 hours in their entire life at work. The one place we spend most of our life more than any other place is in the workplace. And so that's probably why we ask that question when we see the same walls, when we see the same people. Is this really shaping me in a godly direction? Is this really what I want to do the rest of my life? In fact, you may have heard of this show. It's called The Office. Now, I'm in no way or shape condoning the show, but in the show The Office, the main point of actually why the show was written was because he knows that most people spend most of their life working in an office space. And so while they're working in that office space, in the very beginning of that show, you'll notice that people are constantly talking about the absurdity of working in that office. They're working with this guy that's always trying to get ahead, and there's this person that's a boss that seems to be somewhat incompetent, and so they focus on the absurdity of work, and to them, it's just a place that they go to to clock in, clock out. There's no meaning there. There's no purpose in this job. But as the show progresses, at the very end, you end up finding a group of people that found out that there can be meaning in work, that there's hope in work. There's actually love that can take place in work. You can grow in your job. And so throughout the whole series of this show, it goes from these people that thought their work was absurd but actually find that it was a bigger part of their life than they realized. Now, I think that's exactly what Paul is going to be getting at in this text that we're going to look at today, that, that, that your work actually does fit into God's plan for your life. In fact, I think the one question that we want to know more than anything is, all right, if I spend 48 or 50 hours, or whatever it might be at a job, how does this really fit into God's plan for my life? And so what I want to do for this message tonight is I want us to reimagine work. And, and I want us to see work as a place that doesn't always have to make us bitter and in, in a place that we become more broken once we leave there. That as we reimagine work from Colossians 3 and 4 tonight, I hope that you'll see that work is a place that doesn't have to undermine your faith, but it can deepen it. It doesn't have to make you bitter, but it actually can make you better. Because I think what Paul gets at in this text is that work seen with the right perspective, done with the right heart, and producing the right kind of work ethic is actually something that can be good. So as we reimagine work tonight, I want to invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. And beginning in verse 22, this is what Paul says. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Now, if you're reading that text with me, you're thinking, wait, I thought this was a message about the Christian and their work. This is about a slave-master relationship. Well, I, I want to make something clear. Um, the, the, the view of slavery during this day in the slave-master relationship in ancient times was much different than what we know of in regards to like modern slavery. In fact, one of the things that we know is that slaves during this day were more of professional positions. They were oftentimes even teachers or doctors. That's why some people actually believe that Theophilus owned Luke the doctor. And, and so one of the things that I actually read said that there was close to probably 60 million people in Rome that were slaves. That would be one-third of the whole entire Roman Empire that was a part of this situation of the slave-master relationship. So please understand, Paul is not condoning slavery. If anything, we read his text and we look where he says there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male or female were one in Christ. He's for the abolition of slavery. He's not for it. What he is actually describing here is a real socionomic uh, situation where people, most of the people, even a lot of people within the church, are involved in a slave-to-master relationship. But, but even though a lot of these people chose this life, the situation, though, still for them was there was not many opportunities to get ahead. As a slave, there wasn't many opportunities for advancement. And so if anybody's going to complain about their work situation, it's these guys. But if you notice, he doesn't say, all right, listen, slaves. If you're part of a situation that's really hard and you don't like it, subvert the system and you do whatever you want. 
He also doesn't say here in this text, you know, as long as your boss is fair and as long as your boss is reasonable, then do good work. If you notice in the text, he also doesn't say, you know, if, if, if your boss is a hard person to deal with, then here's what I want you to do. Don't work that hard at work. Save all of your energy for church work. That's not what he says. He says, when you are at your job, obey and do what he says. Do good work. You know, one of the words that we use a lot in the church setting is the word witness. It's throughout the whole book of Acts. And in Acts 1 verse 8, it says that we are God's witnesses. He told the people then what he's telling us now to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to Mobile, to Montgomery, to Birmingham, to go to the uttermost parts of the earth and to be his witnesses. Well, what's a witness? Well, we saw something. And and what you and I saw was what our life looked like before Christ. And now we see what it looks like after Christ. There was a time in my life where I was apart from him. But when I put him on in baptism, now he's within me. I'm a completely different person. I'm a witness and you're a witness to the testimony of what Christ has done in our life. And so as as we go into our workplaces, we're witnesses. And so that's why I want you to re-see what witnessing is. Witnessing is not something we do. Witnesses is who we are. And so when you go to work, you are a, a living, breathing witness of what Christ has done. So what does that witness need to look like? Now, I'm going to tell you something that you're probably not expecting a preacher to tell you. And it's this. When you go to your workplace, I don't think he's saying that you need to lead as a witness by sharing scripture, by singing our God, he is alive. That actually the way that you need to lead is through your work ethic. The foundation for your witness is your work ethic. And and the reason is, is because weak work does way more harm than it does actually good. Now, please understand what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there doesn't come a time where you share the gospel, where you open up the word, where you share what Christ has done in your life. Our life is not meant to be like one of those cafeteria trays where it has separate parts where things don't touch. That's not what I'm saying because this whole book of Colossians is actually about Jesus being the center of everything. He doesn't want to be the number one on your list of priorities. He wants to be the page on which all the priorities are written. He's before things, in things. He is all things as Colossians says. And like when you see something you might see made in China, he sees made in Christ. And and so he's not saying, you know, separate your work life from your Christian life, the gospel living from work living. That's not what he's saying. But he's actually saying one of the greatest impacts you can have in your place of work is just work hard. In, In fact, kind of an example of this, when I was at Faulkner, there's a sporting goods store that was right down the street uh, from the school. And I thought, hey, that would be a great place for me to work. Number one, I love sports. And number two, the, the manager there goes to church with us, and he's a great Christian guy, so I could get to work for him. Not the boss, but he's the manager. And so I ended up going up to him on a Wednesday night, and I said, hey, I was wanting to see if there was any way that I could you know, work with you guys over at the Sporting Goods Store, and if you had any openings. He said, well, actually, we don't. We need to hire more people, but our main boss, he's not going to want to hire anybody. He said, but I'll mention it to him just to see. And so I get a text message the very next day from Chris. And Chris says, hey, Andrew, just wanted to let you know. I talked to the, the main guy, and he said he wants you to come in uh, for an interview, and he wants to meet you. And so I was super excited. And so I walk in, and, and Chris introduces me, and he says, um, this is Andrew. And I said, hey, how are you doing? And this was his response. Nothing. He just gave me this blank stare. So I'm all, all of a sudden very nervous because the way Chris had described him was actually very true. And so then he says, well, um, you're wanting to work here, right? And I'm sure I sounded like this, yes. And to which he, uh, I said, of course, yeah, I want to work here. And then he said this. He says, well, Chris is a Christian, and he told me that you're a Christian. So I'm guessing you do good work. Christians should be known for their good work. This guy that was a hard-nosed guy was impacted by the fact that he knew Chris was a Christian and Chris uh, Chris actually worked hard. We as Christians above all people should be known for our work ethic. When people are looking to hire somebody, they say, listen, I I don't know a lot about them. I don't know a lot about even the schooling that they went through, but this guy, he works hard. In fact, Proverbs 10.26 says that if you and I don't work hard, it's like smoke in our boss's eyes. And I don't know if you've ever been in a fire and, or around a fire when smoke starts to hit your eyes. What happens? 
they water and you walk away. He said that's what happens when you do weak work. It does way more harm than good. And so if you and I are really going to be witnesses at our workplaces, lead with a good work ethic. And so if we want to start being a church and a people that reach people that nobody is reaching, we have to do things that nobody is doing. Work hard. And so next in the text, he then builds upon what that really looks like. He says, so when you do this, you don't do it through eye service, not as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. That phrase, people pleasers and eye service, was actually viewed at this time as a derogatory term. It was a negative thing. It was that kind of person that you and I don't like that, you know, when the boss is around, they all of a sudden act like they're doing something. But then when he walks away, they don't do a thing. And you have to make up for their work. And I know a lot of you are probably like, yeah, I can't stand that person. Well, don't point fingers. You did the same thing. Because remember back in P.E., when your P.E. teacher would tell you to jump in jacks, and when she was looking, you would start doing them. She would walk away, then you would stop. And then she walked back by and you're like, 300, 301, right? We all did the same thing. And, and the reason why that, that matters to do good work when the boss is looking or the boss is not looking is because of this word integrity. Integrity is choosing to do what's right even when no one is around. And, you know, we all have a dream of where we want to be in our careers. I, I don't know what it is that you do, but I have a, a good idea that you have a dream, a picture of where you want to be in that career but here's the thing, you might have a great dream about where you want to be, but that dream's not going to work if you don't work. And I love that sentiment that it's the small things that nobody sees that result in the big things that everybody wants. It's a lot of those things that were behind the scenes that were not shared in Insta Story, that were not done around the boss, that actually elevated their career to get them to where they are today. He says, so don't do it as, as a means of eye service, but do it all the time. Here's why. Because who you work for is way more important than whatever it is that you actually do. Notice what he goes on to say. You don't, you don't serve through eye service. You don't work through eye service, but you do so because you're fearing the Lord. Serving the Lord, as he says in verse 24, is actually your reward. One of my goals in this message tonight is to help you see what you do not as an occupation. Because occupation speaks of basically, hey, I'm going to put the bread on the table. I'm just going to give this and provide this. That can be very miserable, and you can run out of energy. I want you to not see your job as an occupation, but a vocation. See, that word vocation actually comes from the Latin word, a calling. That, that you are where you are because God planted you there. And one of the things that I know is that when God plants somebody somewhere, he wants them to be a witness wherever it is that he has planted them. And that's why I think God purposely planted and put God's people around this Roman Empire, right? Because what can happen? Those roads that they actually built, th this, this hard group of people to be around, they actually use that as a blessing to spread his work. God purposely planted you where he planted you to do good work. And so we have to stop separating our work life from our Christian life, our work from our worship one of the greatest acts of worship that you and I can give is to be people that actually work hard. And I think the reason why we've not maybe grown like we want to as a church universally is because we've separated the two. God doesn't want the place that you spend more hours a week than any other place to be a place where you are hard to be around, that you do weak work, that you're a difficult person. He wants you to be a gospel living person through your work ethic. And, and so one of the things that we have tended to do is to separate the secular work from the sacred. God has never separated the secular from the sacred. He wants us, whatever we're doing, to do good work because we're working for the Lord. What it is that we do is, way, is not as much important as that who we work for. In fact, kind of an example of this is Chick-fil-A. One of their main overall mindsets behind what they do is this to think theologically about chicken sandwiches. That's why Truett Cathy says, listen, I know other companies do this, but we're going to do this. I know other people just give you a refill, but we're going to say we're going to refresh your beverage. I know some people just give you a tray. Well, we're going to actually walk the tray at the table. And I know a lot of people will serve buses of kids, but we're going to actually pay for the bus driver when the group of kids comes in. Now, probably a lot of you are going to start volunteering to drive the bus now, right? But he said that's the kind of business we're going to be. We're going to think theologically about everything that we do. If you answer phones, think theologically about answering phones. 
If you are changing kids' stinky diapers all day, think theologically about changing stinky diapers. Think theologically about chicken sandwiches. Your work is meant to be seen through the lens of spirituality. God's never separated your work life from your worship life. The two are meant to intersect. That's like on Sundays at Robertsdale, we always talk about being people that are made for Mondays, having a made-for-Monday mentality, that, that our work matters because it's who we work for, not as much about what we do. And, and so I want to give just four quick things of advice for those of you that, that are workers, and it's this. As a faith-filled worker, I think you first need to have a determination in your heart to not be a complainer. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed this, but complaining has become like the national pastime at work. If you don't know what to say, there's always something to complain about. But I love what Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says, to do everything without grumbling and complaining. Because then he says this, because you will shine like a star in the sky. He's saying, listen, if you are a person that makes a commitment not to complain, the sky is the limit to what you can accomplish in your career. The second thing is this, to have joyful submission to authority. Now, notice I didn't say happy because you might be asked to do something that you don't want to do. But joy is connected to Jesus. Happiness is, of course, connected to happenings. And so no matter what happens, you can still find joy. Not that you always agree, but you understand who it is that you work for, not as much what it is that you actually do. But then also I would say genuine humility is important. To be a humble person. I think back to the Pharisee and the tax collector story that Jesus told. He's like, listen, I can't do a thing with a pride-filled Pharisee, but I can do a lot with a humble tax collector. I think what gets us in trouble at times at work is we think tasks are beneath us. Like, that's not something that I need to do. Like, that's something for someone down there. That's why Philippians 2 says that we need to work like Jesus worked. If you think you are stooping low, please understand you have never, ever stooped as low as Jesus Christ. He came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. And the final thing I want to encourage those of you that are faith-filled workers is to be competitive, but in a godly way. And maybe you weren't actually expecting me to say that, but it's okay to want to get a promotion. It's okay to want to advance your career. But it is the mentality behind why you want to do that that matters. For instance, like if you're wanting to advance your career, it's not to make a big name of yourself, but it's actually to make a name of Jesus Christ. Like the way you, the, and the reason you want to advance your career is because you know what, hey, if I have more, uh, this position, I can influence more people for Christ. If I make more money, then I can expand his kingdom in this. I can start an orphanage. I can, uh, you know, help children in need. I can do all these kinds of things. It's not to make much of us, but to make much of him. And so that's, okay to want to do. And in fact, one person said it like this, that if we're wanting to advance our careers as Christians, just run faster, don't trip everybody else up. So it's okay to be competitive in the work atmosphere. So now in the text, you'll notice that Paul shifts from the worker to the boss. And so this is what he says in chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, bosses, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing and I want you to underline that word because we're going to come back to it, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. We all know how it is with a leader or a boss of a company that you could have the worst job in the entire world, like a lousy job, but have the best boss, and it makes it great. But you can also have what is like the best job, your dream job, but have a lousy boss, it can make it, right? That, that, that the leader of the company matters so much. That, that's what made Jesus such a great leader. He didn't just point people in the direction. He led the way because leadership is about one's ability to influence another person. And he says when it comes to your influence, it must be just and it must be fair. But you also have to know your master. So I want to give you these tips if you are a manager, if you are a boss. I think one of the things that he's saying is if you have people that work for you, number one, pay fair and pay reasonably and reward them for actually good work. And Luke chapter 10, verse 7 actually says this. People do good work, pay them well. In fact, getting ready for this lesson, I read this one article that talked about how businesses that actually had this model to where they give you a place to move up, and they say, if you do this, then you'll get this pay, and that they actually increase your pay, they are actually statistically the most successful businesses. But the ones that don't, 
the ones that actually keep it at a low wage and don't give you an opportunity to, to advance or to move ahead, they are some of the businesses that actually more than likely go out of business or file bankruptcy. Pretty interesting because you would think the more money that you keep for yourself, the better it's going to be. But actually, he says, no, that's not the way it works because it shouldn't surprise us. It's the principle of reaping and sowing. This idea of investing is not something uh, that Edward Jones invented. This is something that Jesus said from the very beginning. But here's the second thing I want to encourage you to do as a boss. And for the workers out there, I know you may not want to hear this, but it really is for your good. Give discipline. In fact, Hebrews 12, 6 says that, that God disciplines those that he loves. This word discipline in the Greek actually comes from the word paideia. And the idea of paideia is that if you loved your children or if you were a boss and you truly loved your workers, you would give them paideia. You would give them discipline. And if you didn't, they were seen as illegitimate children or illegitimate workers. So discipline was actually a sign of love. I remember when I was uh, in... I think it was my senior year or my freshman year in college, I can't remember, but I was working for around two years at, um, off and on with this company that was selling horse shavings. It's these 40-pound bags of horse shavings that go in horse stalls. And so what I was usually doing was loading up a semi-truck with these horse shavings, and we would deliver them to local rodeos and things and dump them in, and people would buy them. Sounds really exciting, right? And so I remember the, the very first day on that job, he said, Andrew, I want you to load up this semi-truck with all these bags of horse shavings. There was a ton of them. And he said, I want you to load them up this way. That's the part I didn't listen to. And so I actually started loading them up in this big, huge trailer, the back of the semi-truck, and I started stacking them this way instead of this way. I get almost to the very end. He walks up. He said, Andrew, man, I hate to tell you this, but... I need you to stack them this way because we get way more in if we do it that way than how you did it. I'm going to need you to take all these 45-pound bags of horse shavings out of this truck and load the new ones in. I was like, are you kidding me? And so for three hours, I actually was spending time unloading them and having to put the new ones in. And I even remember that little car that I had, I had to put on the brights because it was so dark at night. I was having to finish that task. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that story is because me telling you the story is the point. I'm telling you this story because that memory stuck with me. Someone made me do something hard, and I never forgot it. Sometimes in order to be what we need to be, we have to do hard things. Don't be scared of doing something hard. Let it motivate you to become a better person. So giving discipline to work for you and with you is not a bad thing, but actually done in, in a loving tone is one of the greatest blessings you can give. The third thing is this, to model Christ. I, I love what it says in 2, Timoth uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 2.15 when he says that you and I as Christians are to have the aroma of Christ. He said, man, when, when your workers are around you, they don't need to smell dove or right guard. They need to smell Jesus Christ. They need to be like, hey, listen, this guy lives like him. He talks like him. He walks like him. He leads the way, not just pointing out what other people do, not just through eye service, but doing it because you truly love those that work with you and work for you. But the fourth thing is this. You yourself, if you're going to be a great boss, a manager, a leader of your home, whatever it is, you first, as he said in the text, right, you have to know your heavenly master. Notice, he didn't say you just need to know that there's 66 books in the Bible. He didn't say you need to know that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. And he didn't even say you need to know that Jesus lived and then he died and then he rose again. That word know in the Greek, it actually implies not an intellectual knowledge, but an experiential knowledge that you have actually walked with him. You don't know just that there are 66 books in the Bible. You've seen how those 66 books have impacted you. You don't just know that there's a new covenant. You are living a new covenant. You don't just know that Jesus rose from the dead. You yourself have rose from the dead. He says that if you are actually a person that knows your heavenly father, then you are going to be the kind of boss that you need to be. So what he's really getting at is that your relationship with God, when it comes to being a great leader, a great boss, a great mom, a great dad, a great aunt, an uncle, a grandma, a grandpa, it comes to you actually knowing God the Father yourself. And so at the very beginning of this message, I shared with you how... The show The Office was really popular because it spoke to what a lot of people were feeling when it came to their work. Well, in that very first episode, a girl named Pam Beasley, who was a receptionist, 
was interviewed, being asked what she thought of the job, and she said, you know, it's not really any little girl's dream to grow up and do what I do and be a receptionist. In fact, what I really would have wanted to do was to draw illustrations for children's books. But here I am. Maybe right now you're doing something that you don't really want to do. But as we talked about today, I want you to be encouraged to know that who you work for is way more important than what it is that we actually do. And so maybe it could be said of every single one of us, I gave my best, I worked hard because I was doing it for the Lord.